Welcome to the Internet, live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah. This is the Red Line Podcast. I'm Connor Dunstan, your host, and these are my co-hosts... Kyle Holland, Alex Fielder, and our special guest... Mike Christensen. Hey, we've got a super great episode for you today, all about statewide bus and rail networks, and we're super excited to share with you. Today's episode (laughs) format will be a little different, but it should be fun. Roll the theme music. Mike, you're with the Utah Rail Passengers Association, correct? Yes, I am. What are y'all working on these days? In general, we're trying to promote a broader diversity of transportation options in Utah. The specific proposal that we're really trying to push is called Link Utah. That was the name that I came up with, mainly because no one else was using that name. The domain (laughs) name was available. Uh, You know, it's only eight letters long, so that's pretty good. You are a true citizen of the modern world. (laughs) Right. You know, it's it's a pretty snappy little name. But the, the initial main bulk proposal is to actually connect from the Wasatch Front north to Logan and southwest to Cedar City and St. George and southeast to Moab and Grand Junction. To do that primarily all on existing Union Pacific freight rail tracks and uh, to use Amtrak as the operator, that is a model that is generally called state-sponsored Amtrak service. Uh, where basically the state of Utah would pay Amtrak to provide the service. I'm thinking uh, hopefully three trains a day, three round three trips a day. Three trains a day, that would not be bad at all. So going... That's better than the 3, 3 a.m. Zephyr. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, don't get me wrong, I love the California Zephyr. The difficult thing is that when you have a train that traverses 2,000 miles and is going 24 hours a day, it's going to end up having to stop in certain places at night. (laughs) And we just end up that here in Salt Lake City, it stops, you know, at 11 o'clock at night on the westbound trip and 3 in the morning (laughs) on the eastbound trip. And Mm -hmm. the route of the California Zephyr was laid out such that it is daytime when you're going through the Colorado Uh, Rockies and through the Sierra Nevadas so that you get the most scenic part of the journey during the day. Classic Amtrak, optimizing for scenery (laughs) because they don't have that (laughs) transportation. And so you've you've obviously mentioned the California Zephyr here, but uh, there are some other transportation options already in Utah. You uh, mentioned in your report Greyhound, uh, the overpriced airport shuttle, I believe you called it. Uh, <laughs> right. Salt Lake Express. Salt Lake is it? Express. Yeah, uh, I've I've taken Salt Lake Express before uh, to go up to Idaho to visit family. Their service <laughs> is okay on board. Sure. The problem is that they have no off-board infrastructure. Like... Like none. Yeah, like Not none. even a bus terminal. There's no, they, there's they don't no like, have... Greyhound station like there is at Salt Lake Exactly. Okay. There, there's, like, no, no terminals. They don't even have signs marking where to wait. It's, like, <laughs> one of the problems with a lot of the inner-city bus services that we have, there are no, you know, infrastructure off-board and so basically, like, you have to know ahead of time that if I'm going to catch it at the airport, I have to go stand and wait by the sign that says B2 and wait until the bus <laughs> pulls up. And there's there's no sign there that says that Salt Lake Express stops there. And uh, along the route, there are lots of locations where they're basically stopping at convenience stores. And the people that are waiting just have to stand in the com- parking lot uh, of the convenience store and <laughs> <laughs> hope for the bus to show up. Nice. They, they since, you know, we're in a modern digital world, they it is helpful that they do have a bus tracking service, so you're able to whip out your phone and see where the bus is at. 
So that's helpful. But the problem is that if our goal is to spend our transportation funding better and, you know, rely less on everybody having to drive everywhere, <laughs> we, we need to have infrastructure that uh, exists for that one. It, yeah, exists, exists for, for one. one and, like, provides a quality <laughs> experience. So, like, one of the things that would be included in this state-sponsored Amtrak service is that you would have stations that are appropriate to the amount of traffic and a number of people that are using them, which means like having heated, sheltered waiting oh. areas Man, <laughs> and could use those. restrooms and, you know, if it's a bigger station then you know, have some type of convenience store integrated into it. Okay. So, yeah. And of course, so you said that um, your guys' plan uh, extends Amtrak service to Logan. What would you say the advantages are of, say, a frontrunner extension instead? Because we're already going to Brigham City. Right. One of the difficulties that in general we face in terms of transit on a statewide basis and also in just trying to get this proposal to move forward is that probably the best way to say it is like, Highways are ubiquitous statewide by way of UDOT. UDOT is, <laughs> has done friend. a great job of making sure that <laughs> highways are paved and, you know, and the, the, the highways get plowed in the winter and everything. But UDOT has really turned over transit planning and operations to transit districts. And our transit districts all have limited geographic areas. I often have to explain this to people that, like, the Utah Transit Authority is not a state agency. It's not a statewide entity. We wish it was. Yeah, we we, have, like... That'd be nice. We'd have buses and rail that are right. just from Ogden to Provo. <laughs> That's one of the things that I'm trying to push for is is more coordination. But the, the problem is that all of our transit districts are very siloed. And <clears throat> because Brigham City and Logan are in different transit districts, that means that it's very hard for them to coordinate on even getting a bus that would connect <laughs> from Front Runner in Ogden, you know, through Brigham City over to Logan. It just, <laughs> there's even a study that's going on right now trying to figure out how to do that, or, you know, and what, what the estimated ridership would be. Uh, there's a study. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, if this was local to Salt Lake Valley, UTA could just snap their fingers and run it next change day. Exactly. Like, we've made things harder than it needs to be. So because of that, because Logan's in a different transit district, there are no plans. UTA has no plans to run Front Runner to Logan because it's outside of UTA's transit district. Mm-hmm. So that is the big problem. Well, and, and there's also just it's a struggle to get Front Runner built in the first place, and it's mm-hmm. a struggle to get it expanded. Yeah, because uh, you're building dedicated front runner track right. and infrastructure, which, is, which only starts to show its benefits when you're getting that hour, half hour front runner frequency. And exactly. I'm, and I'm not necessarily sure we need that to Logan. Right. Given the way that we're growing, I think that that is a necessity for the future. <clears throat> Especially Logan's just really not that far away from yeah. Brigham City. No, not so. at all. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, there, there are some some technical challenges. I've seen the U- Union Pacific route goes like up right. and back. Yeah. yeah, this thing well, called the, a mountain. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Sardine Canyon's not very forgiving. Right, and so like. You know, people have said, oh, well, you know, can't we just run a rail line over Starting Canyon? (laughs) And it's like, well, the grades are way too steep. So that kind of limits our options because... Like if I if I had an unlimited budget, I would just <laughs> basically build a base tunnel under <laughs> Sardine Switzerland Pass. Style. Yeah, like, nice? if only. <laughs> and and you know that that would be wonderful. But in reality, I saw the best option in your report was kind of a shortcut over the existing UP. Exactly. Route. Like I'm trying to to visualize this for for our listeners, but. The existing Union Pacific route sticks very close to the river, mm. and it actually goes way north of Sardine Pass, and actually goes right by Cutler Dam and Cutler Reservoir. Mm. 
then it branches and the main line turns north and continues on up into Idaho and eventually connects to Pocatello and beyond. But then there's a branch that goes to the south and it does this long loop that goes to the south end of Cache Valley and then goes through Logan and goes all the way up and dead ends at Preston. <clears throat> that's that's where the existing route is. There There is an option that I threw into the, the report, which is actually my, my professional project for my master's degree, where there was an old line that was abandoned years ago that actually was a shortcut across mm. uh, the middle of Cache Valley. It, it goes from like a 20-mile route to an eight mile route oh nice that's pretty significant yeah and so my hope to get to logan would be that you would come up with some type of shortcut like that uh some of that old right-of-way has been built on in the meantime but a lot of it is still there and uh i think that rebuilding that old shortcut might actually end up being cheaper than upgrading the existing longer loop because it's just shorter yeah yeah in the end, it probably costs more, but like the, the benefits over time of having a shorter connection would be... Very excellent benefits. And to circle back to something you said earlier, you uh, mentioned that we're growing rapidly, but right now we're still a pretty like you know low population state. I mean, relatively, obviously. So would you do you think that there's enough demand to support renewed Amtrak service in Utah? Uh, that was one of the things that I really needed to answer for my professional project. Like when I started off on my professional project, I had really grandiose uh, expectations of being able to have a much more comprehensive report and be able to identify a whole lot of costs on this. And then I, I realized quickly that that was beyond my my ability to <laughs> to tackle. And I realized that the thing that I could tackle was to look elsewhere in America and look at other Amtrak routes and look for places that had similar demographics demographic profiles, like Illinois. Illinois has, well, there, there are multiple routes that fan out from Chicago and go to other big cities like Milwaukee, St. Louis, uh, Indianapolis, Detroit, that are kind of no-brainers because it's connecting to multi-million person metros. But the state of Illinois also operates service from Chicago to Quincy and Chicago to Carbondale. And those are smaller metros where there's about 100,000 to 150,000 really? people within like a 25 mile catchment area around the station. Those routes are generating a couple hundred thousand riders a year. Really? So when I saw that and realized that that was a very similar, similar demographically, like uh, Logan, St. George, and Grand Junction are all places where you've got 100,000 people uh, at least within 25 miles of the station. And the distances are comparable to what you see in Illinois. Then I realized, okay, yeah, you know, this is, this is feasible. Like there, there would be ridership generated to justify this. And then even more ridership in the future, I'm sure. Right. And I, I do have to give the caveat that, of course, the Chicago metro area has about four times the population of, yeah. <laughs> of the Salt Lake City metro area. But when you really look at who's riding, people are riding from the outlying communities into the metro area, and that's where the bulk of the ridership is coming from and not the other way around. Okay. Although in, in Utah, we, we would have a tourism component to this, too, that is much stronger than, you know, what you would see in Illinois. Very much, down to St. George and Moab. Oh, right. yes, because there's, like, along the along the California Zephyr and the, the, I don't know what you would call the other route, the St. George Flyer or something. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that was one of the, the routes that we lost in, in 1997 was the, uh, the Desert Wind <laughs> that weird. went from Chicago through Salt Lake City, through Las Vegas, eventually to Los Angeles. Although that completely bypassed Cedar City and St. George because Cedar City and St. George are not on the Union Pacific main line. In fact, like one of the, the aspects to this proposal that I need to mention is that at least initially, uh, we would only be able to do bus service between Cedar City and St. George because there are no rail lines that go into Washington County. 
None at all. None at all. None. Really? Mainly because, like, until, you know, the 1970s or so, St. George really didn't have that much of a draw. And so St. George really grew up after the nation was had built out the rail network. So we, we have a spur line that branches off of the main line and goes into Cedar City, but it basically just dead ends there. The way that we, we fix that in the short term is to have connecting bus service you would have a nonstop bus that would go between Cedar City and St. George to make that connection with the hopes that the ridership on the bus would show policymakers in Utah that we really need to have a rail connection that goes to St. George because it already is one of the, I think it's the fourth most populated county in the nation to lack a rail connection. Yeah, and I see your population projections for St. George. Right. It's only going up. Yeah. I mean, even besides the benefits of passenger rail there, I mean, obviously, as we're doing mode shift, we want to get away from delivering by truck as much as we can and sort of uh, move back to delivering by train a little bit more just for the environmental and social benefits of that. Exactly. It is also cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, St. George is at a disadvantage because there's no way to get freight rail and in and out. Yeah, and that stunts the industrial capacity that they can exactly. Build. It's like even though you know I don't think there are huge plans in the works to make St. George an industrial powerhouse, <laughs> but it still like limits what what industries could be located there because you can't get freight railroad cars in and out, and it also potentially makes people's groceries more expensive if you know. The price of diesel skyrockets. <laughs> it's going to be harder to get stuff in and out. Yeah. 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 So that kind of covers the St. George end. Uh, it's a little bit circuitous to, to serve uh, both Moab and Grand Junction because Moab is on the end of a 22 mile long spur line uh, <laughs> that is not heavily used at all. <laughs> but I, I realize in, in looking at things that the, the key to really making the ridership work on the southeastern line is to have it connect to Grand Junction because Grand Junction is not that far into Colorado and it's the most populated place in Colorado on the west side of the Rockies. So it just makes sense to to make that connection. Mm -hmm. And in the tourism factor that you mentioned a few moments ago, obviously there are something like, what, 12 national parks within (laughs) striking distance within striking distance of these two rail lines you're proposing. So do you think that there would be like a major tourist component in ridership, like you fly into Salt Lake City, you take the Green Line downtown, you get on your Amtrak, then you get a bus connection to a national park? Yeah, that's what I am hoping to to integrate all of this together. And one of the problems that I find when I talk to different groups throughout the state that are trying to increase transportation options is that a lot of the different funding pools are very siloed. Like if you run a senior center, you know, in a small town in Utah, you can get federal funding to buy a bus and give seniors a ride around town. But that money is pretty much all focused on only being able to be spent on seniors and there's like other programs for veterans and for people with disabilities but we struggle to really realize that it'd be much smarter if we would just come up with a good public transportation system that everyone could use (laughs) yeah yeah and that's that's some of the difficulties that when when I talk to colleagues that we realize that we need to to figure out and uh, what what I'm proposing really starts to fill that gap because like one passenger on the train might be riding it to go to Arches, another might be riding to um, to visit family or you know to to come home from college for the weekend and somebody else might be writing it because they need to get to a medical appointment and yeah our current system like we we do you know pretty good within like 
UTA's zone. But, but outside of that and Cache Valley, there's just... Right. <laughs> I looked at some of the other transit districts you listed in your report, and one of them just has one bus route. Yes. That snakes around through the in, in, the entire little city and I just mean, does that's, thing. I mean, that's certainly, that's better than nothing, but I think it could be better. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm hoping to, you know, just change the the dynamics of how we how we look at mobility throughout the state. And like a lot of times when you, when you propose these ideas, people say, oh, well, you know, the, the funding for that just isn't available. And I always get very frustrated because you go, <laughs> you know, anywhere along <laughs> along the freeways and you constantly see construction. And so I think maybe the have... funding is not going the right place exactly. is, what's, is what's really I happening. I think UDOT's capital budget is about a billion dollars a year. <laughs> Yeah, Which is and a lot of money, man. <laughs> meanwhile, we're just trying to get so, some Amtrak running on existing rail. Right. And a lot of times Amtrak kind of gets overlooked because people uh, really want something shiny and new and fast. And so <laughs> a meanwhile, lot of people... Meanwhile, California. Right. Oh, yeah. good gosh. The world's greatest boondoggle. <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> So, like, a lot of times people say, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't bother with Amtrak. You should just promote high-speed rail. And High-speed rail from here to St. George. <laughs> uh, yes, as we yes. know, those are two major population and job centers. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like, like... tens of millions of people each. Yeah, it's like, well, yeah, it would be great, <laughs> but realistically... We don't have the population to justify that, and we're probably not going to have that population for another 100 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a national priority because there are dozens of other corridors that are very high-demand corridors that would need to be built out first. Like, say, Texas. Northeast Corridor, Northwest yes. Corridor, California, Texas, yeah. Florida, all those places have a much higher priority. So maybe let's chalk that one up on the Christmas wish list. Exactly, <laughs> um, yeah. Santa. I, and so I try to explain to people that even if we had a massive shift in transportation priorities and we were massively funding high-speed rail everywhere, the timeline to actually, like the preparation to organize high-speed rail and to get a plan that and is then a to get massive it built. Of construction. Yeah, it is like a three-decade process. It's like and when we built the interstates, except more. Exactly. <laughs> and we're seeing, if, if you go to California and see how, how long it's taking to get high-speed rail built there, you you quickly realize, well, one, like the one of the last conferences that I went to before the pandemic hit uh, was a conference in Sacramento, and part of it, we did a tour of high-speed rail construction around Fresno. And the scale of infrastructure that you have to build in order to enable a train that goes 200 miles an hour is massive. And uh, when you stand under some of the viaducts, it just makes you feel tiny. (laughs) (laughs) I imagine it's even harder to build in the Intermountain West, isn't it? Some aspects of it would be super easy, like... Uh, Land. Land. <laughs> if, if you're building out in the middle of Nevada, it's relatively easy, but where you've got areas that are very mountainous, basically you end up just realizing it's cheaper to build a tunnel than to try to run a rail line through the mountains. But the hardest thing is actually building new rights of way through urbanized areas, like if it's already been built out. Even if you want to build a tunnel under things, people still uh, throw a fit. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good old NIMBY issue. Exactly. So eventually when I start explaining issues like that to people, they they quickly realize, oh, well now I see why you want to use Amtrak to operate on existing corridors. Like the costs are a fraction of what building new infrastructure would be. Sure. Now that we've sort of circled back to our state-funded Amtrak here, uh, how does that work? Like, we know you talked about the Midwest, and uh, I believe there's the Front Range is a new sort of state-funded one that they're planning. How, How does it work in general? To get it to move forward seriously, we first would really need to get the state of Utah behind the idea. We would have to get some funding together for a comprehensive study that would 
would bring together Union Pacific as the owner of the existing rails and Amtrak as the operator and the state of Utah of Utah slash UDOT as the one pushing the idea. And basically we would have to uh, to look at every inch of rail on the system and figure out what would need to be upgraded or changed. And we would come up with, well, a couple of different scenarios, but we would come up with capital cost estimates to know what the initial cost would be to get that up and running. And then we would also come up with ongoing annual operations and maintenance costs do you anticipate that there would be significant sections of track that would need to be upgraded for passenger service or like? The main lines would not need a whole lot of upgrading. We might need to add uh, a few extra sidings here and there so that trains could pass each other. And we may have older sidings that don't have powered switches that you mm. would want to upgrade. So if you don't have powered switches, then then somebody has to manually get off of the train <laughs> and go and throw the switch. And that, you know adds additional time. So it's like s- relatively small, minor upgrades uh, on the main lines on some of the branches like getting into uh, Cedar City and Moab and Logan. A lot of those I think are all old jointed rails where you've got a joint every 30 feet or so and so when the train goes along it goes clickety clack and that not only is not so comfortable for passengers <laughs> but it also puts wear and tear on the wheels and so uh, we'd want to upgrade those to be welded rails and to also be upgraded for higher speeds. So it's like yeah there are some upgrades and we'd also want to make sure that we have all of our passenger rail running on tracks that uh, support positive train control which Mm. is the safety systems that ensure that trains don't run into each other. (laughs) Or derail on curves. Always a good thing to have trains not running into each other. Exactly. Yes. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of like the main things that would need to be upgraded. But it's a fraction of the cost of having to build new, build new infrastructure. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And, well, initially trains would be running at a top speed of, well, statutorily it's 79 miles per hour, but it's easier just to say 80. But all of the new uh, locomotives and rail cars that are being built are pretty much all capable of doing 125 miles an hour. So as sections of track get upgraded to higher maintenance classes... Exactly. You can run the trains faster on them. Right. So the the best way of like looking for opportunities for that is looking for where the rails are already, you know, level and straight. Like going from Delta through Milford to Cedar City is like the prime candidate for where you would want to put in those upgrades. Excellent. So you mentioned three trains a day per line. What do you think operating costs would be on that? Like, what's the state going to need the foot? Right. That, I, I'm not in a position yet to okay. really be able to estimate what it would cost. Uh, so in the report, you mentioned the connecting state-sponsored bus service. Is there any precedent for that in other states? Yes, several states actually, but since Colorado is right next door, that's (laughs) usually the one that I point to. Their state Department of Transportation, CDOT, you know, a few years ago they realized that, hey, well, they, they still had the same problem in some areas where they had transit districts that were neighboring each other that weren't connecting together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For example, in Denver you've got RTD, which is their UTA equivalent that operates trains and, and buses. You've got, uh, in uh, Colorado Springs, is it Metro or something? I, I don't know the name of it in Colorado Springs, but you've got a different transit agency in Colorado Springs. You've also got a different transit agency up in Fort Collins. And Colorado Springs is is actually a really big city. It's, you know, I think like at least a half million people. Uh, I don't know how how many people are in Fort Collins, but Colorado State University
University is in Fort Collins, so there's a big draw there too. But basically, they didn't really have like maybe they may have had you know some Greyhound service, but they didn't have much connecting transit service that would get you you know amongst these three transit districts. And their their state DOT CDOT finally said, hey, let's just establish a state sponsored bus service. So now there's several buses a day that are operating from Colorado Springs to Denver and then on to Fort Collins. And, you know, that worked really well. So then they started looking around the rest of the state and realizing, well, we've got these outlying rural communities that don't have any connecting service. And so they expanded that system And the ones that are going to outlying communities are usually running just once a day. But you can get throughout most of Colorado now by bus. And And uh, it's not Greyhound, it's state-sponsored bus. Right. Which is going to have better coverage and it's going to cost you as an individual less. Yes. In fact, it's interesting because it's probably been a year ago now, but I actually talked uh, over Zoom with the manager of this busting system uh, who works for... Yeah, they came up with the name of busting and you know have have a nice horse on the side of the buses but i i talked with the guy who manages that and works uh with cdot he said that the way that they pay for it is interesting because they subsidize it a hundred percent out front so they they just don't expect any fares to be offsetting the cost. Makes sense. But the they do age. charge fares. It's just that the money that they collect from the fares goes into their capital improvement fund. Oh, that's an I excellent like idea. And so it's actually a really great way of looking at it because they're not expecting to to try to offset the cost of it. They realize that that's not the point. The point is that it's bringing benefits to the state. The main reason why they charge a fare is just so that if a bus fills up, up, they, they can guarantee that they've got a seat for everybody. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I really want to see that same type of model instituted in Utah and combine that with the state sponsored Amtrak service as the backbone of the system and have the, the ribs of the system filled in with buses. Excellent. And then um, I have one personal question for you <laughs> because I am from Boise, Idaho. And we are one of the largest uh, cities in the country that does not have any passenger rail Mm -hmm. service. Uh, So in conjunction with your Link Utah plan, would you consider, uh, like, say, a joint Utah-Idaho-Oregon state-sponsored restoration of the Pioneer Line? Because that's been big talk in Idaho for years. Yes. Uh, I'd actually like to see that connection being made by train in a couple different ways. <laughs> One would be the restoration of the Pioneer, which, well, it had a couple different routes through its history. At one point, it was going from Chicago through Denver and Salt Lake City and then branching off and going through Pocatello and Boise and on to Portland and Seattle. And then they wanted to give some service to Wyoming, so they changed the route of it so that it would branch off in Denver and then go through Cheyenne and across southern Wyoming and go through Ogden and then Pocatello, Boise, Portland, Seattle. And, you know, that was a a long-distance train that had dining service on it and had sleeper cars. And so I would really like to see that be brought back as as a service that would get you a one-seat trip from Salt Lake City to Boise and to Portland. And, yeah. And there's a consortium of advocates from multiple states that are trying to get that going again. We're calling it the Greater Northwest Working Group right now because it's all of these states in the Northwest, which if you look on the Amtrak map, there's a big hole where there's no trains. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that kind of goes around South Dakota and Wyoming, which are two of the 48 contiguous states that don't have any Amtrak service at all. <laughs> and Idaho's, that's, that's Idaho's close to that oh, because Idaho yeah. only has one oh, station. Oh, yeah, like our great and, station yeah. in Sandpoint, right. which is, you know... So, yeah, I want to see the Pioneer (laughs) restored, but I also want to see additional state-sponsored service that would be extended into Idaho. So not just your cross-country Amtrak, but also your more local service. Exactly. 
And I would love to see, like, have the, having the Pioneer going cross-country, but also a local state-sponsored service that would go from Portland to Boise and one that would go from Salt Lake City to Boise that sure. would supplement all of that. Perfect. Thank you. And then um, real quick question to end the interview. Off the top of your head, what is the most important thing we can do right now to make Wink Utah a reality? <laughs> Well, the thing that I've been struggling with ever since I created this, which it grew out of my professional project when I graduated with my master's in 2018. The beautiful 130-page report we've yes. all been yes. looking over. Is beautiful. Which is actually only about 20 pages of actual text. And <laughs> I did like all the maps Most of it and is maps and tables. Yeah, yeah. We like maps um, and tables. Go read that. <laughs> it's in the description. <laughs> But as I was getting close to graduating with my master's, I realized that I really wanted this to be my dream job. <laughs> but I realized that like it wouldn't exist yet. So I needed to move from like the planning and implementation mindset to an advocacy mindset. <laughs> and so I created a nonprofit. Uh, the nonprofit Utah Rail Passengers Association to advocate for this. And uh, I've gotten lots of thumbs up from lots of people, but I've been struggling to get funding and every little bit helps. So, you know, if people, you know, go on the website and donate $10, that's great. But I'm really looking for, for larger sponsors. <laughs> so if anybody out there knows of anyone that wants to see this happen who has deep pockets i <laughs> would love some sponsorship i i also I, I realized that my own fundraising efforts were not going very well midway through last year and so i started looking around and decided that i needed to bite the bullet and hire a professional fundraising consultant so i do have uh, a grant writer that is working on getting funding and getting grants so Hopefully some of that will come through, but uh, yeah, if, if there are people out there that have resources and want to help make this happen, go on the website. You can find out how to get in contact with me. <laughs> All right. So give the man some money and call your legislator because yes. that's absolutely and crucial. Right now, we don't really have a whole lot to, to tell our legislators because we don't like have a bill or anything. But I, working with some other colleagues, we are hoping to sometime soon convene some type of interim committee with members of the legislature to look at how we can better serve the mobility needs of the entire state and not just the Wasatch Front and, and how to connect better to other states. So this is getting towards that comprehensive study. Exactly. That yeah. would be the first step so that is actually the first building step this. We need. So right, and it's like okay, we we know that Biden passed the infrastructure bill, and it's got tons of unprecedented funding for passenger rail in it, but. Utah currently is not in a position to grab any of that because we need to uh, study how the implementation would go forward first before, because you can't just show up to the U.S. Department of Transportation with an idea. Just, just give get, me some money, Joe Biden. Give me some money. Because <laughs> it's like a billion dollars would go a long way to, to actually getting this up and running, but the government's not going to give us a billion dollars unless we, <laughs> we have don't a plan. Know anything. <laughs> That's what exactly we're going to do with a billion dollars. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, oh, you're welcome. Mike. We really appreciate your expertise on this whole topic. Uh, also, thank you for being our patron. We appreciate the, the, ni the $9 that went towards paying for our website. Uh, yes. That's, that's an excellent thing. Uh, our sources for this episode are Mike Christensen. Please visit his website, at, uh, the website of his nonprofit, I should say, the Utah Rail Passengers Association. They've got all sorts of great resources. Um, other than that, we didn't actually have any sources this time. So, <laughs> because Mike already did all, did all the research. Yeah, he did yeah. all the research a master's for us. Degree. Yeah, he's <laughs> he he pulled he did my job this time. So thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, but thanks for listening. Uh, please remember to hit the like button, subscribe, follow on Spotify. There's a new rating system on Spotify, so give us a five stars out of five and. Uh, be sure to watch our Twitter. Thank you so much. And again, if you know anybody with deep pockets... 
who likes rail, point them over to the Utah Rail Passengers Association. Yeah, give the man give the man some money. We all want. I want to be able to go to Moab on a train slash bus. That would be brilliant. (laughs) And Logan and Idaho Ah. and Portland. Yes, we could do a podcast trip to Portland. I am well known as a fan of Portland. Okay. (laughs) All right. Thank you all, and goodbye. Goodbye. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. You're welcome.